This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. Hi, everybody. Um, my first class started with a project called Kill Your Stop and This Project. Instead of talking about several things that we have done over the last 30 years, I thought we should go back to the first 10 years, which was a period of intense learning for the years. In fact, it was so phenomenal that we actually changed the entire structure of the organization, the mission, and the everything about the organization. I think there are several lessons which need to be told even today so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. Uh, let me also tell you that I'm a practitioner, I'm not a scholar, uh, not an academic. So most of the things that I've been talking about is from experiences from my colleagues and myself, and we will walk you through the first 10 years from 1986 to 1996, uh, going back about 30 years. Are you able to see the, the presentation? Hello? Uh, I, I don't think the presentation is up right now. You might have to share that screen. Okay, we can see it. So, the Foundation for Ecological Security basically works towards conservation of nature, natural resources, through effective local governance institutions at village level and the landscape level, so as to provide good economic, ecological, and social outcomes. That's broadly the work that we're in, involved in. In the next 30 minutes, I'll take you through two dimensions of the work. But essentially, in the first 20 to 25 minutes, I'm taking you through the lesson of what was called a pilot project. In fact, people called it a mega pilot project, and you would know soon. And then we'll talk about the strategies for future and where we are heading. This was conceptualized. The name sounds pretty cool. Free Growers Cooperatives Project. Um, in mid 80s, satellite imageries were being thrown out by the Indian Space Research Organizations for civilian purposes. It was at that time that uh, a word called wastelands got popular because several of the imageries were throwing out landscapes which did not have most probably agriculture or forests and there were scrub jungles which we also have a colonial legacy where most categories of land, um, one particular category in particular, it could be somewhere between 30 to 40 million hectares of India's landmass of 329 million hectares, that's about a tenth of India's landmass, was called wasteland. And the Prime Minister then, Rajiv Gandhi, wanted a people's movement to restore this so-called wasteland, and he had an ambitious target of 5 million hectares a year. And I think over the last 20, 30 years, probably we have been some 10 million hectares, though it was supposed to be done in two million hectares. So when the government of India approached another organization, our parent body, a national dairy development board, they had three basic tenets which they were looking at. National, to say briefly, National Dairy Development Board was very actively involved in promoting village institutions. They called it milk cooperatives to help village women in particular in gaining better returns for processing milk and selling it in various places across the country. The government of India wanted to reforest, revegetate and reforest to degraded plants and they wanted to do it through people's institutions. It, this was the days when social movements were gathering days and we had projects like social forestry, uh, arts petri forestry, joint forest management all coming up. So it was in that kind of a context that this initiative was requested by the government of India to this body called National Daily Development Board. And some of us got down to drafting this pilot project called Tree Growers Cooperatives Project. And we made a couple of fundamental choices. We said that we would revegetate village common lands 
and this would essentially be towards meeting the basic needs of the rural poor. We didn't really realize then that we were making real political choices when we determined that. By basic needs, I mean small timber, firewood, fodder of the village women. So, as for the project, we jumped out, I passed out from a management school. Someone told us that 100 acres was a good number, so we started revisiting 40 hectares, which is 100 acres of revenue waste lands. And because we were housed in this organization called NDDB, that's the state government board, we started forming milk cooperatives. Instead of milk cooperatives, we were calling them tree growers cooperatives. And as land was uh, owned by the governments, and they were calling it revenue waste land, after a lot of lessons, we actually got the governments to agree to transfer lands on long term lease to village communities. And then we thought it was just about plantations, woodlots. And we would go wherever there was a good village mill cooperative, we would go to them and we were spread out, we were scattered. And before we realized, we were about 150 people. And so National Development Board thought that it actually requires a kind of a separate organization and all the primary tree growers cooperatives could be, started, could be affiliated into a national level federating process and we were named National Tree Growers Cooperative Federation then. So, what was in this milk cooperatives that attracted the government? Is basically, if you understood Amul patent cooperatives, milk cooperatives were named white revolution variously by uh, several people who studied it and who accredited it. They were milk cooperatives, they had a very strong control by the village people. So, this was something which was appealing to the government and they wanted more of decentralization, people owned institutions. The second aspect of these milk cooperatives were they were very, very transparent at the village level. A person comes with the milk, the milk gets tested based on his fat percentage, his or her fat milk fat percentage. The next morning, a uh, payment would be made, accounts are maintained. If at all you adulterated the milk, you would be punished, not rewarded. Not rewarded. So, these are the positive aspects of the milk cooperatives which got into our world. However, there were three other things which were not so uh, in retrospection when we went to a serious analysis. We saw that uh, cooperatives, as wonderful as they are as social constructs, they were essentially Indian cooperatives were centered around private property like milk, sugarcane, eventually into growing vegetables. So a uh, private property, private resources, cooperatives, which are also some kind of commons were very good. However, there was a mismatch when we were looking at land and water where basically everyone who lives in the village has a right over it. And there was uh, there were several features in this common property which were different from the private uh, property resources. The second dimension which was very different and which somewhere comes because of the Indian Cooperative Act is there's almost uh, an unsaid push towards merchandising, towards selling produce. This, of course, comes from milk, which is the perishable commodity, so you have to sell it off, you have to make chocolates, butter, and that's a valuable uh, return to the village people too. Similarly, with sugarcane, you make sugar, and uh, the whole cooperative act was crafted in such a manner that merchandising and sale was a part of the cooperative act. The third, whereas in the three first cooperatives, people were not really interested in selling. So they were looking at meeting subsistence needs. This was on the serious mismatch between the cooperative concept and what we were aiming to do. Another important aspect of this cooperative acts, both is merchandising and the, the membership part, uh, which I'm talking, going to talk about, are actually prescribed by the International Cooperative Alliance which are almost like the Ten Commandments, which, which are the principles based on which they recognize cooperative action. And they imply that anyone who wants to get into a cooperative has to get, get in voluntarily. However, things changed at the lab. When we started working, what we realized was one part of the land, that was the revenue waste land, was being protected by the village, whereas they were exploiting the rest. They were over-harvesting, over-grazing, or they were not really managing the remaining part of the land. Because of our interest of merchandising and the way 
social forestry uh, and progress on forestry as such was happening, there were more and more commercial species like eucalypts, uh, cassiorina, subabul, lucana, lucifala. These were being promoted essentially for commercial purposes that they would meet paper for requirements, they would meet small timber requirements for the cities and the growing area. The other important thing was the model was constructed around woodlots. It was not really looking at the myriad, several other uh, functions that ecosystems work on or provide services for. So this model was working around creating woodlots. As it turned out, in the villages, when we were working, it was also having an unintended but a clear casteism which was being brought even in the animals. The way the cooperative was functioning was, in order to get better returns, milk producers will allow uh, cows and buffaloes, but they would not allow sheep and goats. But we all know sheep and goats are the backbone of the real poor people. These are the ATM machines. So the, this business model of body actors was unintentionally also promoting privatization of this land towards the big animals. Even in, it's not only in the design, in the mechanisms that were being furthered, um, it is very easy for professionals like us who go from outside to think about options as a very simple, effective mechanism. But where in a world would a village woman who finds it even difficult to buy one week or one month of uh, food, where can she participate in, in an auction to buy firewood for the whole year or for a good part of the year? So this was the kind of a business model and how it was getting interpreted on the ground with several questions being raised by uh, colleagues um, on are we doing the right thing. One particular part is this was working like an efficient institution, but because cooperatives are wonderful social concept. However, for the common land, there is a bit of a departure. They were, in a way, resulting because of the voluntary membership, the village commons were getting privatized to the people who were voluntarily becoming members of the cooperative. We all know very well who becomes voluntarily members, whereas in a situation with the history of uh, disenfranchisement over several centuries, the very poor, the voiceless people, are very skeptical about voluntarily coming into something. At least in the 80s, it was very, very difficult but to expect a poor person to voluntarily join something. So, really, really, we were privatizing the commons into the hands of the very people who had other resources. The second dimension we were observing, because again of the cooperative concept, is it is a representative democracy. So village people are supposed to throw up some management committee members, and they also have what is called as a secretary to do the day-to-day -day functions. We realized because of this, the political nature of elections, basically the management committee members were not necessarily representing the very poor people in the village. They belong to a different uh, caste and of a different uh, economic threat altogether and the power was getting centralized more and more in those people. Then we were only looking, by the very structure of the cooperative, we were only looking at the business sustainability of the cooperative rather than the, how is the whole ecosystem functioning? Is it a viable system? Is Abhi working within the ecological thresholds? Is the... Hello? Okay. The last one, though, is about uh, where is it? What's it's about the, the government's favored uh, lease of land to cooperatives. That's where they were somewhere bound to work on wastelands and with this lease, and they were uh, they were favorable towards working only with cooperatives. Uh, I think it's fair to say that cooperatives were a form of a body where the government could still exercise control. So the governments who were very about transferring village lands to the village people wanted to exercise some degree of authority uh, by 
forming this lease arrangement or exercising some control over the cooperatives. So on one hand, it was an efficient village institution which was providing fodder, which was increasing the milk activity. There were wonderful trees growing, but it only handed out all this to a group within the village, not the entire village. So in a way, the farmers were getting privatized. So over the years, what we did, we, it was a very difficult thing to do. In 93, um, 94, when people within the organization started talking about, are we working for nature? Are we working for village people? Are we working for work? And is it really helping the village work? What we realized was that cooperative, as wonderful a concept, concept it is towards helping private property resources, it is incompatible to work on farmers because of this uh, two principles, merchandising principle and the principle of voluntary membership. And fortunately, in 90s, uh, there were several other decentralization moves within, by the governments itself by empowering more of the village councils. We then realized actually that what we had been hoping for was to foster cooperation, but we were instead mistaking cooperation as cooperatives. How could these village institutions become, by, by, by the very genesis, by the very construct, inclusive bodies where Say, if I'm a person from born in India, I don't have to apply for a citizenship in India. Similarly, if you're born in a village, you don't have to apply for a, a, a membership in a, an initiative of the village. They, they have every right to every inch of land which is commonly held in the village. So the governments were also in that kind of a fold. There were opportunities coming up in terms of not only wastelands, but even Forest lands were being opened up where people started recognizing the value of engaging with village people and they started forming uh, joint forest managements, pasture land committees, and so on. So, the, sec the important principles we learned was how could it become a universal franchise where every adult, man, woman, youth could, by the very design, become uh, active stewards of their common lands. Instead of relying only on five to seven people or nine people for managing this whole affairs, how is it possible that the entire village assembly actually decides on the matters and the executive functions would be handed over to some of the, some of the people within the village. The other set of uh, things which we, initiatives which we did was we we did not look only at one piece of the landscape, but we started working on forest lands within the area. We started working on pastures, also wastelands, so that we actually address the issue of ecosystem regeneration to provide economic opportunities, no matter what administrative category the government calls it. So we grew from working with one piece of land into the entire landscape. In, instead of moving towards sale of timber, instead of moving towards sale of fodder, even within the village institutions, we, we started discussing with village people about how can they exchange. It was not an easy thing at all. Um, I will come to that a little later. But basically, mechanisms which are very friendly to the poor and to women, of you know, headloads of carrying firewood or taking a cartload of fodder, that, those were the important shifts in the mechanisms which were more helpful in commoning this uh, land. We also had to intervene and uh, talk about how small ruminants are also important part of the uh, uh, economy in the villages and how the lower caste, lower class people could also, uh, should also be included in the, in the access to resources uh, such as pastures and water bodies. So, what did we learn from all this? We learned, firstly, cooperation is not necessarily cooperative. We should look at uh, commons and cooperation, collective action, but not cooperatives in the very design of it. There are 
even now as we speak, there are several initiatives by NGOs, by governments, who mistake this difference between cooperatives and cooperation and their incompatibility to commons and somewhere uh, lead towards privatization of commons. We realize that commons are the basic, irreplaceable uh, resources which are very valuable to the uh, poor in the village. We also realize that should equality someday manifest, these are the playing grounds. Common lands, common water bodies are the playing ground based on which some of village people can actually negotiate their terms of existence as equal members in the society. We also realize that uh, we should not just look at woodlots or forests. It is a range of ecological functions which village people are actually interested in, which village people have been living for centuries and not just a monetary uh, economic benefit. So while economic benefits are important, village people also look at social outcomes like collective action and the spin off from there. They are very, very interested in hydrological flows, nutrient flows, pollination, pest control, which ecosystems offer. We also realized that uh, governance is not one uh, homogeneous thing. There are governance layers nested within, the, within an ecosystem. There might be forest people who are interested in just forest produce. Uh, there might be pastoralists who might be interested in the pasture. How is it that these user groups, these user regions, are nested within a larger governance uh, mechanism of the whole village so that there is a debate, there is a dialogue between various interest groups. We also realize that it is scary to align merchandising or to mistake merchandising functions with collective action. There are clear governance functions and there are separate merchandising functions. It is best if merchandising functions are subservient to the larger governance functions the villages are supposed to uh, manage or they do manage. We also realize that efficiency is not the only thing that we need to look at or financial feasibility is not the only window one that we need to look at. You need to look at the whole and there could be a range of uh, trade-offs between social, economic and ecological which makes total business sense to village people. We also realized that uh, nowadays when we went back to villages and we asked them to correct our mistakes, we admitted it was our mistake and if we uh, if they could make changes, about 50% of the villagers asked us to go and jump. They said they were not interested. You said you came and you brought in all these things. We are managing it well. We don't want you to uh, change this towards the poor people or towards ecosystem. But there were other good 50% of the villagers which actually listened to the to the fairness of what we are talking about, the need to bring along everybody into the fold, and they made the corrections. And if FES, and as an organization, we have been open about it, and we have spoken about our mistakes to several people, what I am saying is, even today, well-meaning people, well-meaning initiatives end up actually doing the same mistake over and over again. So, just quickly, we Having learned all that, what we have moved towards is what we call as promise of commons. We all have learned people interested in ecological governance, have learned about tragedy of commons. I won't go into the theory of it, but what we see out of 20, 25 years of work on the ground, it's actually the promise of commons in many ways. We are working with some 16,000 villagers, uh, India has some 600,000 villages, 8, billion, 8 million people, and some we are about 1.3 billion people. We work towards transferring land to the villages on long-term lease, and in some situations, even the whole possession of the land gets transferred to the villages. We have learned to work on long-term issues, forest, forest regeneration, hydrological research takes time. And these are not possible within project frameworks, but as an organization, we pick up a landscape, we work with them through decades. 
and we also are one of those organizations who work with the government because the land is in their, their books in order to transfer it to the village before we sign a going to the government. The three types of things that we do. We empower villages or we actually strengthen and enhance the collective action instruments here of temples, management or whatever local initiative. We take that to the uh, commons management. We arrange for the transfer of land rights from the government to the villages and wherever the ecosystems are under disrepair, we access public funds to restore them. These result in improved ecological benefits and in economic opportunities. We have so far covered 5 million acres of land, about 8 million people. This is the kind of a picture. When you allow nature to function, restrain your activities a little, same landscape in 1987, 88, and we monitored this, several ecological studies, collective action studies, social ecological thinking. This is the magic that uh, is possible. It's the same landscape being monitored for 30 years. Another one in dry deciduous parks in South India, again, now it's thrilling to know that there are brown bears also, top bears, brown bears also visiting this landscape now, and it's totally through village level collective action. It is increasing biomass, which results in fodder, which results in milk, it results in meat. It also improves the hydrological flows, so you have agriculture, productivity, resilience, as well as taking a second crop where they are lucky. It is on the whole resulting in increasing incomes from about $2 to $3.5 to $4, depending upon the uh, landscape. That aside, the money matters aside, actually what we are into is making are uh, joining hands with village people and making every person in this world an equal citizen. These are the unsung heroes in villages, heroes and heroines, and these people are the true commoners. We are in the business of working with them. Right now, the scope is 210 million acres. We are only in 5 million acres. So how do we address the situation? We are going to work on something like 30 million acres in the next five years working with 38 million people, two four strategies, basically work with governments, other NGOs, so that they also accept and they also, as opposed to the cause of commons, with good evidence. And we are also partnering with governments. We have partnered with three state governments out of India, 28 or 29, in mainstreaming policies on, uh, uh, and programs on, uh, on uh, national resources with commons in the main. We are also pretty savvy with uh, technology, GIS, and remote sensing, and we want to use this as a strategy for uh, impact at scale. And we are bringing together think tanks, policy makers, judiciary, media for widespread action so that commons uh, is seen alongside government uh, and individual property. Uh, commons also need to be viewed as a separate space. So as an organization, we are growing more outward. We want to translate all the good knowledge into action. We want to play a role in joining dot between practice, policy, and science. We want to use technology at big level because that's a great enabler. Of course, the recent uh, developments in the technology space side also requires harmony. <clears throat> and we are filling up the void at national and subnational level. There's considerable international attention from land rights groups, uh, from tenure facility, from RRI. That is all at an international level. We want to focus at national to subnational level. So, now slide is, how do we build a large constituency for commons? It should not just be an FES talking about it. Uh, so how do, we build, how do we build village people as commons and rewards of nature? We also are looking at it that we don't have to leave it only to the government to do all the functions. There is considerable space for collective action, uh, which is already inherent in society across the world. How do we strengthen that space? Uh, is another important direction. We are also challenging ourselves that we talk about forests and pastures. We have to really connect to how it is making a difference in the income levels for the poor person. Or how is it making a difference in agriculture uh, in terms of pollination or pest control? The challenge is in making commons a part of the vocabulary in areas like agriculture, livestock, governance, 
uh, as a, a need, as an important integral element, rather than just looking at problems in isolation. Lastly, we are, we are uh, and as a celebration of this week, we want to reposition tragedy of problems as promise of problems. Thank you very much. I think I'm in time. Thank you so much, Jagdish. That was a very insightful, insightful webinar session. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up the floor for any questions. So if our attendees want to um, ask any questions, they can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'll give that 30 seconds. Looking at it, would you know where all people are from? Uh, not really. I can I can just judge by the names they log in by, but I can't tell from where they're where they're attending. No, no one question. Mm. Are we going to record this? Uh, yes, we're going to record this because um, a lot of because right now the time in the United States is three thirty in the morning. Um, and a lot of, I know that a lot of students out here want to watch most of these talks. Um, and this will be posted on the on the on the um, World Commons Week website, the, the same website that has your abstract and description of your project. That's great. Fantastic. I would also like many other people to see. I can't tell this for the year. Yes, for sure. I think that was that was one of the aims that Charlie had when he wanted to conduct this webinar series. Um, so it looks like we don't have too many questions, but I have a question myself. Um, you talked a lot about, you know, the growth and expense of your organization through these smaller, you know, dispersed cooperatives. Um, how did you go about centralizing the management and like merchandising operations uh, for all the services that you provided to these villages? That's another important lesson. In fact, when I'm talking to you right now, sitting here, this was the summer. We remodeled it into our office. So we were basically looking at uh, uh, timber, um, sawmill kind of work, and we actually could not make it then. We basically, what we wanted to see was use cooperatives as an instrument uh, to see if village people can sell their trees remove the middleman from it, bring in some technology value addition, and see whether the village person can actually uh, get better results. It's a, it's a nightmare, I might say. There are so many Western interests. It is it's a huge mafia, which is into controlling people business. Uh, it is just, uh, fortunately, I think we, we carefully slipped out of it because there was a Supreme Court rule, Supreme Court ruling which did not allow heading of trees somewhere in like this. So all our operations had to be stopped. And we knew that we could not replicate it. So what is the solution where we can probably provide 10%, but we were not the 10% higher returns, but it was not easily replicable. So it stopped us. Then we did on forest produce, like um, acacia pods, uh, we also did tamarind, uh, sale of tamarind, basically aggregation and sale, but nothing, I think some of this requires a different market function. We need to construct another kind of an intervention rather than thinking that uh, a cooperative could do it. Cooperative has too many interferences and too many laws. The only example I can talk even now is milk cooperatives, uh, which is still somewhat successful, but they are also going through a revolution. They are quickly moving away from a cooperative act into a producer company act so that it does not allow too much of government interference and they really work like a professional body. That's the larger traffic to Interesting. Um, another question, just to, just to conclude this session. Uh, you talked a little bit about um, you know, the GIS spatial analysis system. Uh, would you be able to expand a little bit more on like its scope for the future and, and for your for your organization. Oh yeah, that's my favorite topic also now. Yeah. Basically, see, if you are involved in forest land and water resources, you need to have a spatial view. Those days we used to call it, we need a bird's eye view of to see where the forest is, where the water body is, where the agriculture is, 
where one village is in the neighboring village. So we were into remote sensing and GIS, Canadian scripted as a nice facility. Then we started looking what is the basic problem in it. There is no interdisciplinary work happening. Ecologists look at only ecological issues, social science look at social science issues, and economists look at profit and growth and linear growth and all. So how could interdisciplinary science happen? So that was one of the main considerations. Of course, as I said, we needed to have a spatial view and a temporal view. What is this land in 1990 and how has the land use changed to 1990, I mean 2018, so that that can trigger discussions at the local level. So it's a spatial view of uh, interdisciplinary parameters with the temporal understanding. We have about 600 uh, parameters that uh, is how socioeconomic, biodiversity, and ecological. We could we have big data, we have primary data, we have secondary data, all of which we want to house it and it is advanced pretty well. We develop applications, tools which are useful for village level neoliterates or semi literates, so that there can be some uh, judicious action around water conservation, around land management around biodiversity conservation, as well as improvement in incomes. So we are, this is called India Observatory. We are having it off as a new organization itself. Um, basically, to look at spatial technology and information technology, translate all this into actionable, underlying actionable products useful for village people. Otherwise, it is usually NGOs or scientists who use it, but all that results in algorithms and all, but how can these algorithms actually go to village level people, where people use this on a day to day basis? That's what we are involved in. It's a huge work, it's for different bodies of work. People, young people find it very interesting and I really like that. Technology can be a game changer. It can be impacts at scale are possible, big fans of technology. India still has challenges, there are about 30% people who still are not connected on mobile, but we are ready. Rapidly progressing, but we have fixed the offline online kind of thing. Even where this internet is not there, we are able to handle that uh, into mapping, into monitoring changes, into seeing where groundwater can be recharged or uh, where it cannot be recharged. So that the huge public expenditure in India, which is about 4 billion, 5 billion US every year, there can, those funds could be utilized in a more judicious manner for the forest. Fantastic. Yeah, I know that um, the reason I ask is because the scope of GIS analysis, especially here in the U.S., is is immense. Um, and I want to, uh, all of it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly view to see if anyone has any final questions that they might or comments that they might want to ask. And if not, then I will go ahead with my concluding statements. So I will give that thirty seconds. All right. Well, it looks like um, yeah, it looks like no, there are no more, there are no further questions. Um, again, Jagdish, on behalf of the IAC, IASC and the World Commons Week organizers, I'd like to thank all the attendees and, of course, Jagdish for preparing and giving this fantastic webinar session. Um, and again, just to finish off, uh, on behalf of everyone here in the World Commons organizing team, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jagdish. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.